So last week was ML at scale, and it was like a virtual conference, and there was a bunch of um, talks um, about uh, machine learning and uh, LLMs and that kind of thing, ML ops, LLM, LLM ops. And uh, so I'm just going to give a quick recap of it. Um, it was a conference that spanned uh, two days, so it was about like eight hours in total. Uh, and so day one, we started with a keynote um, by Evan Sparks, who's the co-founder of Determined. And he covered basically, he just explained like the, the necessity of infrastructure solutions. So a, uh, you know, ML models are getting more and more complicated. They're getting larger, they're getting harder to train. And, um, and a lot more people want to use them. So before it used to be a lot more of a, you know, ML models were a lot more niche, but now it's like every company wants to use them, but there's not enough expertise to go around. You know, not everyone is a DevOps engineer. And so we need these solutions that kind of take care of this for people. Um, and at the same time, we want open source solutions because um, first of all, I think everyone agrees open source is great and you know, everyone benefits from open source, but it also accelerates progress. Um, and so we get the, the field will move forward faster. So after the keynote, um, we had a talk by Aurelian and Christian from HPE. And they just covered, um, they kind of explained the, um, the different services that can be provided. So for example, end to end, meaning, you know, everything from uh, model design to training and deployment or optimization of uh, models that the customer brings to them or doing a more of a collaborative um, approach. And there's also the, the, uh, the approach to actually creating uh, ML solutions. So first it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a cyclical thing where first you have to understand the data, you experiment to come up with AI solutions, and then you have to, once you have a solution, you scale. And um, this keeps going as you get more data and you update your models. Uh, then we had Sanchit from booking.com and he talked about large language model ops. So this is like ML ops, which is like DevOps. And basically the reason why, you know, it's, um, it makes sense to have a new category is because there's there's some differences from previous uh, ML categories. So before you had things like you know computer vision, let's say that's like one of the biggest fields, and um, so you, let's say you had ML ops for that. Well, LLM ops is are, is going to differ a bit. So um, one issue is that there's this kind of this new field of prompt engineering that requires some consideration. This is very different from any other. Uh, any other previous uh, ML tasks we've really had. Um, there's also different types of data. So if you were just dealing with computer vision before, everything was images or videos, that kind of thing. Now you have um, different types of data, like uh, chats or images or combination, uh, combinations of those. Um, there's more API calls. So the models now are getting very large that people don't really want to be running them on their own infrastructure necessarily. Um, and so like if you want to use uh, GPT-4, uh, you have to make API calls and GPT-4 is really like the the best there is right now So if you want the best model, you're gonna have to do um, You're gonna have to use the models through API calls rather than owning the the model yourself necessarily um, There's increased demand for vector stores. So that's like a whole new engineering challenge uh, The vector store is really popular because people will like to do retrieval augmented generation to improve uh, sort of bas basically reduce uh, model hallucination and uh, of course, there's a huge amount of attention, public attention on this, and that's brought the attention of regulators. And so there's more demand to make sure we understand what these models are doing, uh, make sure, you know, in some cases, there might be need to moderate the outputs of these LLMs. So that's kind of uh, what's, what's changed from uh, previous machine learning operations. Then the uh, final talk of day one was a demo by Corey from uh, Determined AI. And basically he showed how to use Determined to benchmark LLM inference. Um, so he showed, he just walked through a whole bunch of steps. So he started with like the most basic script and then he kept on adding to it. And he showed how you can evaluate the performance of different combinations of uh, models. So these models were from, you know, downloaded from Hugging Face um, and different combinations of model, uh, data type, number of GPUs, and like doing single process versus deep speed. 
and then he he was able to log all of this to determined um and that's definitely one worth watching there's a lot of coding involved so it's hard for me to really communicate um, everything he did and uh after that there was uh, some birds of a feather sessions uh there was two of them and there was a lot of interesting discussion about you know ml um, systems infrastructure um, tools uh, future of llms and so on then in uh, day two we started with a talk by isha who's on the call right now um, and she provided a walkthrough of the basics of determined so using the pytorch trial api um, to describe like how the model should be trained and evaluated uh, and then there's a config file, of course, where you specify, you know, the hyperparameters and so on. Uh, you can also specify hyperparameter search, and then you can view all this through the determined web UI. And uh, she showed this using uh, the application was transfer learning with um, at, uh, MedMnist, which is like a biomedical data set. Then we had a talk uh, by Jimmy about basically the importance of reproducibility. So reproducibility, um, we want to be able to make sure that when we obtain a model that we can reobtain the same model if we rerun re the experiments. And you know these are things that are affected by like random seeds, uh, the hardware you run it on, and uh, really importantly, the data. So if you you know if anything about the data changes, your model is going to be different. Um, data is, you know, more and more important these days, that's basically what makes these models uh, so powerful. So um, keeping track of changes to data is really important. And he explained how there's kind of two life cycles to ML ops. There's the code life cycle. So that's where you're creating algorithms, you're training your model, and then you're deploying, and then you, you know, iterate on that. Uh, and then there's also the data life cycle where you're collecting data, you clean it, uh, you split it into different, you know, train test validation sets and uh, you monitor how the data you have for training differs from the data you're getting um, in production. Um, and these change. So as, as you get new training data, um, you're going to want to update your models. And uh, he explained how Pachyderm plus uh, Determined, you can have these as a, a, a good pipeline. So Pachyderm takes care of the data versioning and does the data-driven pipelines while um, Determined can run the you know ML training and there's parts of determined that where you can sort of um, get fairly good guarantees of you know deterministic M ML experiments. And uh, after that, we had Andrew um, explain kind of like the it's it's the counterpart to Jimmy's talk where Andrew actually showed Pachyderm and determined in action. Um, and so he explained, you know, the benefit of having a Pachyderm determined case or pipeline where when the data changes, you can just update the model automatically. So you can have this pipeline that gets triggered automatically when data changes um, so that you don't have to be going in there and like retraining the model manually. Um, and he showed this with a computer vision object detection task. Uh, and he showed how, like how to use the the Pachyderm SDK plus the web UI uh, plus determined for model training. And the last talk was by Liam, and he talked about um, basically the benefit of fine tuning your own LLM. So you know prompting is really powerful, but of course the the model has to have been exposed to the right data. And if you fine tune, first of all, you can maintain control of your data and model. Um, you can get better performance, and also you can get uh, you can use a smaller model, so you don't have to necessarily be using this huge, you know, GPT-4 size model. If you fine tune on a on a smaller domain, then um, you can afford to use a smaller model and and still get good performance. Now, the challenge with that, of course, is you know training these models is difficult. They're very large. There's huge memory requirements. So he gave an example like 20 billion uh, 20 billion parameter model. Uh, requires 320 gigabytes of memory during training. There are, um, you know, approaches, parameter efficient methods that reduce the amount of memory required, but they typically result in reduced performance. So, you know, fine tune the whole model is uh, preferred, and um, that this is exactly the kind of situation where determine can really help. 
because it, it'll it'll help you with distributed training, which you're going to need when you're um, training models that require so much memory. And uh, that was basically it. So for me, the the um, LLM stuff was super interesting. I mean, that's always been um, so like the talk by Liam was really interesting to me because it, it got me up to date a bit on some of the terminology. And uh, yeah, I mean, if there's if there's any uh, specific talks, if you attended or if there's things that you are interested in hearing about in the future, let us know. Uh, we want to know what you um, you know find interesting uh, in these talks. All right, so with that said, I'm going to go on to explaining some new features. So if you go to, let's see, there's this new blog post, uh, relatively new, about a week ago. And in it, um, talk about this new thing called detached mode. And so what is detached mode? So it's available starting at version 0.25. And uh, so it builds on something called the core API. But you'll notice here actually says core v2. All right, so first of all, what's what's core v1? So uh, if we go to the docs and we look at, uh, let's see, API guides, okay. And so there's different APIs. The one that's always kind of uh, introduced first is the PyTorch trial. Right, You're, you've probably seen this if you use determined. So you define a class and you, you know, you you describe how to build the data, data loaders, what should happen during training, and so on. But there's a lot of cases where you know you already have a lot of training code, and you don't want to necessarily rewrite it into this format. You just want to. Um, You'd like to basically keep your code as is and then just like import some functions. And that's what the core API is for. So core, core API doesn't have any class like that. Instead, you have just this um, context. And this context comes with some functions for like reporting, metrics. Um, and you can run things exactly the same. So you run with like a, uh, your regular config file. It's just that you aren't using this um, you aren't using a class to define every part of your code. So the uh, core v2, I don't think there's actually any documentation on it yet. So um, this core v2 um, has a different approach. So it's not, um, uh, hold on a second. All right, so it's not, um, it, if you look at it right, if you look at the first thing here, what you you have a main function, and then you just define. It. So you don't you, you no longer have this like context manager. Um, instead, you just have this uh, you know core v two, and then and then you access the uh, functions anywhere. Um, and so it works exactly the same, except that the benefit is is that you don't need to have a config, so you can run these just as regular Python files. So if you go, let's see where. Uh, so if you look at core API, this is like their example. You have uh, MNIST training. This is the regular thing. You have to run it with a metrics. You know, so you have to run it with a config file, and then you you run it like here. You would run it as um, uh, so technically, OK, you could, if I go into here, if I go into core API, and I run Python train, it'll, it'll run. Uh, let's see, it's going to start running. I'm running on this on my laptop, so it might be okay. There, so it is running, but um, so then if I go back here, this open, um, you'll see there's there's nothing running. So determine is not actually doing anything. Um, so you, it's true you can run the file, but it, it won't actually um, won't actually capture anything. So when you're using this the the existing core API, you do need to um, actually run it with like a config file. And then, so when I do this uh, det e create, um, and I pass in the config file, it, it sends it to the um, determined cluster, which is on my laptop right now, and it, and then it actually runs. Uh, so 
that's that's like the existing version of the core API, and this new mode, uh, detached mode, is using core v2, which is like more uh, an experimental version right now. And this uh, this detached mode, you can run your your Python scripts like as is. Okay, and what is the point of detached mode? It's basically it allows you to t use determined as a metrics logging. Um, system. So determined doesn't take care of any of the distributed training or anything in this case. All it does is uh, record metrics. And so you can use the web UI to do that. And then as you get comfortable with it, you can, you know, transition to having determined manage the actual training process. But if you want to just get like uh, the simplest start, then you can, you can do this. So actually, you know, I already have, let's see. So well, maybe I'll just, let me see. I'm going to rename this. It's a bit crowded. So, uh, so if we actually just move some of the stuff in here, this is just like a really simple example. It doesn't actually do anything. It just, um, this example just like logs a bunch of random numbers, but it gives you the idea because usually you're doing like a, ML training, you always have some for loop, so you can just pretend like this is where your training would happen, and then you would report, report some stuff. Um, let's see if I can get this formatted. Okay. And let's actually add another loss. Um, two I times two, or I'll just do another random number. Um, and uh, Okay, so then if we run this, this is this is the case where if we go, I'm just going to change folders here, and if we run this, hopefully it should actually run. All right, so it printed a bunch of stuff, so it ran, and I ran it just like a regular uh, Python function uh, uh, file, so Python train. I didn't call like that e create. I didn't do any of that, and uh, if we go to our um, Dashboard, you can see, okay, so the name was, you can see the name is defined here. So this is the experiment name, detached mode example. It just ran right now, um, and it printed a whole bunch of random numbers. The loss number two, also random numbers. So this is where, you know, you log your losses, your accuracy, whatever, and um, you can basically uh, use determined, and you can just insert this code into your existing training code. And you don't even have to have like a config file or anything. Now, if you do want to, um, well, actually, let's let's see. There's there's another. Before I jump to the config, um, you can. So it can it can also manage state of your metrics. So here, I'll just copy some of this over. This is basically the same code. It's just got a bit more. Um, it's got a bit more stuff to it. So here you can see um, we still have a name, but we have a checkpoint storage. So I'm going to set this to uh, the current directory. Um, checkpoints. All right. And then this, this ID here. So the thing is with the experiment name is that you can run an experiment with the same name multiple times, um, but you might want to have different. So the the IDs here in this unmanaged config um, object basically tell it what to continue from, whereas the the name is more of just like a um, it's just like a visual thing, just so you can keep track of what you're running. Whereas this experiment ID and trial ID are like actual important. That they they correspond with the checkpoints that are being saved. Um, so I think I actually have to say I have to change this because I deleted some checkpoints before, and I'm pretty well. Actually, I'll see if it crashes. I'm pretty sure it's going to crash if I don't change that right now. Um, okay, and then there's some code for fetching checkpoints, and um, I'll explain a bit more of this in a second. Log. Oh wait a minute. You know what? I think I had the the whole code here already. All right. So. Um, if I get rid of this, let me just see if I was right and it's going to crash. Okay. 
Yeah, okay, so it cracked, okay, yeah, because what, basically I already used this ID and then I deleted the checkpoints. Um, and actually I want the folder to be elsewhere. Hold on. I want the folder to be detached mode. And um, so so anyway, if I, I have to set a new ID now because I basically I messed things up by deleting the, the old checkpoints when I was uh, playing around with this. So let's try it now and see if this runs. And then I'll uh, walk through the code a bit. Uh, did not, oh, maybe I already used that. I think I already used that then. Okay, try another ID. That one's also not found. Oh, that's weird. Uh, latest checkpoint. Not that then I'm sure what it is <laughs> train old so I'm in the right okay yeah there so maybe I was using maybe I had used that ID before anyway so all right so what's what's going on here is basically I've got the I'm here I'm defining the the experiment name so if I go here uh, like I showed before um, that name gets used that that's basically what appears in the web UI uh, then the checkpoint storage this is where the checkpoints are going to be stored. So I, I put, I defined it to be in this subfolder. And so you can see each checkpoint gets a UUID and there's some, um, you know, metadata, like number of steps. And then you can save anything you want in, in here. So I'll show how that works. Um, so after, after you define, after you initialize the um, core API, you can check here, all that's happening is just checking if there's the latest checkpoint that exists, and um, and then if it does, basically it restores that, and it, it restores the data. So the idea is that you want to, if you're training a model and you have a bunch of metrics, um, or, or anything that you want to save and you want to resume, then this is how you would do it. You can you can just reload anything that was saved during. Um, your previous run or, or your interrupted run or whatever. Um, and so that's all that's happening here. It's just, it's just reading the uh, latest checkpoint folder and the state file. So the state file here is just, is just text. That's all, it's just a comma delimited um, text file. And it's just loading like the iteration. Um, I also added something called special tensor and so it's also loading that, and then I save it later. So that's why there's a tensor.pt here. Um, so, and then here, uh, this is like, this would be like your training loop uh, where um, this is where you actually want to log stuff. And so this is the key value um, function call. So core v2 report training metrics. Um, you just have to pass in steps completed. So that that's basically going to define like where it appears in the web UI. Um, and then the metrics you want to log. So normally, you know, this would be like the output of like a cross entropy loss or whatever. Uh, and then here, this is where we're saving checkpoints. So this is this is uh, what creates these folders. And so the metadata.json is created automatically by the core API. Um, and but after that, so within here, all this stuff is like you can do anything you want. And just save it at, um, into the the um, path. So here, this is why there's like a state file that contains the iteration and the loss at that iteration. So if we look at an example, this is step 49, and the the, the loss was 0.3. Um, and then I also just use like torch.save um, and save this you know special tensor i have so this could also just be like a model uh state dict or anything uh so you, you can you can see like the core api is very unintrusive it just um you can have everything you do normally and then just add like a bit of extra code um to help you you know report metrics and and uh, load and save checkpoints um so let's see so yeah, so then then that's basically um, 
how you would run this this is called like unmanaged meaning determined is not managing your training you're just using it for metrics and um, if you do want to transition to uh, a a managed version then all you need to do is, is add like a config file you can um, specify the entry point so you just add the the basically the command it's, it's exactly the same as like you would normally have with uh, if you're using PyTorch trial for example and then it should work let's see if I do det e create config and then in the right folder all right so create experiment 46 running yeah so I think it seems to be running correctly um, so that so it's as simple as that so you want to go from uh, the unmanaged mode to the managed mode you just add this this config file and now you're ha you can use distributed training and so on I'm not going to do that here because I'm just running on my laptop but um, this is how you you know you could now just send it to a, a cluster. So that's that's one thing. So when you're when you're just using metrics, your determined cluster can be really lightweight because all it's doing is reporting metrics. Um, so it doesn't even need a GPU or anything. Now, once you do transition to like a managed version, um, that's where you're going to want you're gonna you're gonna want a GPU cluster. Um, so that's detached mode. This was basically, like I said, it's it's kind of like a progression from you know, the PyTorch trial API, then we we had Core API, and then now we have something that's even more. Uh, it's like about as unobtrusive as you can get, um, and you can get get the advantages of determined uh, with just a bit of code. All right, so the other thing I wanted to show, it's not really a new feature, but it was new to me. So let's see. Oh yeah, are there any questions? I can't. I can't see right now. Let me see if I go. Uh, all right, no questions right now. Cool. So the other um, thing I wanted to show was this callback thing. Yeah. So this was a question that got brought up in on GitHub. Um, maybe I'll just show. Let me see if I can go there. All right. So if we go to the discussions tab, there was this question, which I, I wasn't, you know, uh, I didn't know how to answer it first, so I had to research it. But basically this person wanted to um, upload data. So, so they're, they're, they, they create random train val splits um, and they create random train val splits like inside the PyTorch trial API. And then they want to be able to reload those because like they want to do inference and they want to use the same train valve splits, of course. So they want to know how can they save this in a convenient way without doing something like uploading it to some, you know, AW, you know, GCP bucket or whatever, like AWS. So without, without having to do something complicated like that, can they just save using determined? So it turns out that's possible. So I'm going to show you. Um, basically, what you have to do is use this thing called the PyTorch callback, and you have to call that, or you have to define what that does. So here I've got a PyTorch trial, and it does nothing because I just wanted to make it as small as possible. Um, I just wanted to illustrate the point. So like the model is nothing, and the optimizer, they won't even be used here. But what I do have, I have these like uh, train and val indices, and these are to simulate what the, the person was talking about. Basically, you have some data and you want to save it and you want to load it at some other time, you know, outside of your training run. Uh, and then you can kind of just ignore this stuff. This is just like fake data and the training and evaluating doesn't do anything. But what, what we do have here is this function called build callbacks. So what this is, is uh, you, what you have to do in this function is you return a dictionary with the uh, some arbitrary um, keys. So that the keys are just like names that you give to your callbacks, and then you map to the actual callback. And here we're just initializing some callback and we're passing in the indices. And 
So what is the what is the callback? The callback is uh, it's an instance or it's a subclass of PyTorch callback. And that's something that Determine has defined. You can see we're importing it from determine.pytorch. Um, and there's there's a whole bunch of, actually, you know, I should just go to the documentation. Let's see. There's a bunch of functions that are defined in there um, that you can uh, fill in, basically. Yeah, so this is PyTorch callback. And so you can specify as many callbacks as you want. They can all, all do different things. Um, and you, and for each callback, you can specify what happens at these different um, moments during training. So there's like on checkpoint end, you know, uh, after the checkpoint is loaded, or I guess that would be further down, um, you know, all, all different moments during training, basically. And there's a whole bunch of them. So the, the one that, um, well, actually, so if you look, if you look at the different functions, they take in different, um, they take in different arguments. So there's actually specific ones. So like this one takes in, you know, dictionary. This one takes in, takes in the actual checkpoint directory. Uh, other ones just take an epoch index. So in our case, we want the checkpoint directory. So uh, the solution to this was to use, I think this is the only one that takes in checkpoint. Uh, looks like it, yeah. Oh no, there's another one on checkpoint right N on checkpoint N. Oh, and this isn't deprecated. Yeah. So the, the only one that takes in checkpoint directory is on checkpoint right end. Okay. So we're going to use that. We're going to define what happens. Uh, we're going to say we want to save to the checkpoint directory because we're, we're getting that as input to this function. And, and this is how basically we can save our train indices. So remember, we were passing this in uh, when we were building the callback. And these indices were defined up here. And so we can pass these into the callback and you know, it gets set in, in the callback. And then finally, we can save them. And this is going to happen uh, every time uh, a checkpoint gets written, so at the, at the end of checkpoint writing. Um, so if we actually run it, let me delete this first. And All oh, right, no, that's that's actually when loading. But anyway, let's let's run it anyway. So I think it was um, in the wrong folder. I need to go to callback. So if we run this, if I go to the experiment callback example, and it finishes really quickly because it doesn't do anything. Um, so it finished, and. Um, there is one checkpoint, OK? And if we go here now, and if we go to the loading, so this is supposed to simulate like what the user wanted to do, which was after they've done training, they want to be able to load that, you know, basically metadata about their training, about their data set, you know, so what, what the train val indices are. So this is, this is using the, I believe it's called Python SDK, actually. Let me just check. I think it's a Python SDK. Experimental import. Claim. Yeah, yeah. So this is the Python SDK. Actually, I think this is going under undergoing some sort of refactoring. So I don't know how many of the functions are going to remain exactly the same. But anyway, what the Python SDK allows you to do is access all your experiment data. It, you can even like launch experiments from uh, using this. You can uh, access your model registry. You can do all sorts of stuff. You can do like most of the things that you would normally do at the command line, you can actually do with the Python SDK. So you can do things programmatically if you want, rather than um, using the CLI. So anyway, so that's what that's what that's the name of this is Python SDK. And so we've got the client, and um, we just specify we can get information about a specific trial. So the trial we want is forty seven. Okay, so we just put that number in here forty seven. And actually, I'm kind of curious what this prints. If I print trial, let me just comment this stuff out. So Python loading. 
Okay, it's just it's not going to print the full details. It's, just, it's going to print representation. That's fine. Um, and then uh, the trial has information about like what the top checkpoint is, and that should I don't know if it's going to print the st string of that. Yeah. Okay. So checkpoint. It's some class, and it's got this UID A A five A A, and you'll see that of course that matches this. That makes sense because um, that's the only checkpoint associated with this, and um, what else? Okay, so then, then um, checkpoint directory. That's actually. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's just going to be some local thing, but yeah, there should be some way. Of, let me just see. Actually, I'm curious if that can be modified because I don't remember. So checkpoint. What was it? Download. Download. Okay, yeah, you can specify the path. So, uh, yeah, so defaults to checkpoints, checkpoint UUID relative to the current. So, wait a minute, so if I do, let me just see. So, if I do um, path uh, and then do it again. Yeah, okay, so download the same thing in here. Okay, so you, you can specify the, the directory. Um, and uh, so anyway, you download that. And now you see if you go into the, this is that UUID for the specific checkpoint. Um, it also comes with the code. I didn't realize that. So it comes with the code that basically like uh, the stuff that you see in the web UI. When you go here, you can see all the code associated with your training run. So it downloads that as well. And then, um, importantly, it's got the stuff that we saved. So it's got the train indices, val indices, and that was specified in our callback. So loading that then after, like once you have the directory, then everything is just totally normal. Like there's nothing um, mysterious about it. You're just gonna use torch.load and you're just gonna load from that file path. and um, should those yeah one two three yeah so those are the ones just as a reminder here we got one two three four five six seven eight um, which is what we defined here so this is how you would accomplish that you can also access the uh, let me see if I do this one yeah so there's um, so if you want to like load the model state, I'm just trying to remember. So it's I guess it's models state dict, and uh, oh, whoops, like this. Uh, yeah. So here, yeah, it's, there was our model was just uh, one linear layer, so it's just got a weight tensor and a bias tensor. So yeah, you can load all that information is also saved. So that's saved automatically. The custom stuff was this uh, train and val indices. And uh, so that pretty much covers that example. Um, let's see, what else? There's, there's another feature that's uh, not really new, but it was also new to me. So I might as well just uh, cover that real quick. There was, um, I just wrote a, a blog post about it. Where is it determined? All right, so if we go to blog, oh, we're here already. So anyway, there's this, There's another um, thing that was released, I think back in like April. Um, it's called the PyTorch Trainer API. And this was actually already covered in a previous, uh, I think, open office hours. Um, but I thought I might as well, you might not be familiar with it, so I can explain it really quickly. Basically, uh, it just lets you like run if if you're using the trial API. Okay, so forget about like the core API and all that. If you're using the the trial API, uh, like we are using here, then you can use this PyTorch trainer to run your code locally, and then um, it just makes it so you don't have to send it to like a determined cluster, even even a cluster on your laptop or whatever. Like you can just run. Um, it entirely uh, locally, 
and then you can switch to a cluster without basically like any effort. You don't need to change the code at all. You just need to change how you call the code. Um, so you, it, it's got just some standard, you know, uh, functions. You first you define your trial, your PyTorch trial, and then you pass that into the trainer, and then you just call dot fit, um, and that's going to train it. And there's some convenient flags like test mode equals true, so that'll just like run one batch at a time. And uh, yeah, and then there's some boilerplate you can add basically. So like if you want to um, have distributed training, you should just add some some of this sw like the switching code here. Um, and then you can run it locally, you know, doing distributed training, or you can now you can uh, use your config file and actually send it to the determined cluster. So it's a really convenient way to like just try out your code initially, uh, make sure you get it to where you want, make sure there's no bugs, and then actually run your real uh, training job um, on the cluster. All right, so I think that's pretty much covers it. Uh, let me just. Let's see, is there anything else? Let me just check. Um, yeah, I think that covers it. So I'm gonna stop sharing and if there's any questions, did I stop sharing? Yes, I did. Yeah, if there's any questions, let us know in the chat or wherever. You can also, um, the other really good places to ask questions are on the, Git repo, that's one good place. I'll just paste this into the chat. You've got the Git repo. And you also have the, the Slack. Let me copy this link. All right, hopefully that one works. Slack is really good. So the Git, it's kind of like different styles, you know. Uh, some people prefer GitHub, some people prefer Slack. On GitHub, um, if you got like a bug or something, you can open that in the, like an issue. Uh, if you have more like brainstorming, like, you know, ideas about how you might want to train a model, that's a good place to, uh, that's good for like discussions. There's a discussions tab. Uh, and then Slack is also really good because you can get, um, very fast support by like the engineers. They can, they'll respond really quickly. Sometimes I've seen, uh, people take it into the DMs, you know, if they want to talk more privately about their issue. So Slack is also really good for that uh, if you have any questions. And um, yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up. I'm going to stick around for just a couple more minutes in case anyone has questions. But uh, also, if you want to, um, some of the documentation is being overhauled, which might, might, interest people. Let me just, uh, if you're curious about like installation and you haven't, if you haven't actually gotten into the, into the, uh, process yet, installation guide has been very much improved. So if you go here, um, this is, this is one thing we're really working on is trying to improve documentation, like make it easier to understand. Uh, and so one of those things is like installing. And when I first joined, so I actually just joined in uh, August, so I'm pretty new. Um, one of the things I noticed was like, it can be, it, the, the actual process for installing determined is way easier than it seemed like when I first looked at the documentation. So that's why there's been like steps to improve it. So now if you go there, you can see it's like really straightforward. You just do a pip install and then you use this really convenient command debt deploy. So getting started is, is very easy. Um, and then you can do, you know, that's like if you want to do locally, you can even do debt deploy for, you know, more, uh, much more complicated things. Like you do debt deploy GCP and it takes care of a huge amount of stuff. Like I don't even understand what's going on, but it does all sorts of stuff with Terraform and it sets up your, your VM and it just manages everything. So it's a very powerful tool. Um, so I would definitely check that out if you haven't already. And uh, so with that, if there aren't any questions, I am going to leave it at that. And I hope this was informative. All right, thanks everyone.